one thing I've noticed like in the pilot aviation industry is, is they talk about proficiency and they talk about how like, okay, like your checklist, right? They say ch these checklists essentially were written in blood because something had to go wrong, very wrong to have the standardization put in place. Or they talk about complacency. And that's something that's really stuck with me from a business standpoint is always being open-minded. Doesn't mean you have to go make a change, but just listen, listen to what's out there, talk to people, you know, and, and not being complacent of where you are, knowing that there is other people. And if you surround yourself with a network of people like we have in other industries, you realize, and like Jonathan Potoshe talks about, think bigger, just, you've got to think bigger. And you realize that, you know, I got guys, that, they were running like a million dollar company. They joined the mastermind group. And they've been doing that company for 20 years. And all of a sudden they join a group and they see other guys that are doing 10, 20, $30 million. And they're like, holy shit, yeah, I can do that. And yeah. then now five years later, Sorry. they got to send them to our company. It's crazy. So yeah. it's been, I got goosebumps yeah. talking about it because it's so cool that it works. Chad, uh, dude, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, so would you mind just really quickly for our hundreds of viewers, uh, <laughs> would you share the uh, business that you own, whereabout you guys are located, what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate being and for the invite. And EJ is awesome. You know, awesome to meet you. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, so again, I'm Chad Curry. I, uh, I own CLC Landscaping in San Marcos, Texas, which is basically smack dab between Austin and San Antonio. Um, and so, you know, we like to, like, we do everything in between. We don't really go into the Metroplex. Um, it's kind of the niche, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. from a, uh, may not be the best way to measure, but we're the highest rated by at least over a hundred reviews, um, in our area. Um, I'd say we're probably the biggest in our area that specializes in residential design, build construction. Um, we're starting to get in some bid build a little bit more on the commercial side. I've stayed away for a while. Um, and then we do regular lawn care um, for residential, um, whether it be a, typically like the mid to high end home. Um, so not quite the estate style, uh, but we're, you know, we, uh, we've kind of starting to find our niche and we're really starting to focus and hone in on that. So we've made some pretty cool changes over the last six months and got some pretty cool changes that are continuing to happen over the next six months to really make this kind of full circle and work like we had anticipated instead of just being the, you know, like we all started just a guy that just does everything, you know? So, yeah, but, um, I was a terrible, I was a terrible weed control technician. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty monotonous. I, I can say we, we do offer the service. We're not, we're getting better at it. Um, it's, uh, at the beginning, it was me just trying to make it very simple. Right. So we don't have, you know, like a lot of guys that I know that do it very well, you have all these custom blends and they spray and what they say pull hose which is kind of funny because the first time I heard, I heard pull hose i was like wait what did you just say and uh, <laughs> i understood what they meant by that <laughs> so now i just like saying it but um but we don't actually pull hose unfortunately so uh you know we're doing a lot of the granular spreading applications so you do and, all granular even pre-emergence interesting uh we do and we we do carry a backpack spur with uh blue dye in it and that's not spray we do that every single visit um and that's seven rounds yeah. a year but you're not using any big tanks yeah. for anything. It's yeah. all great. No, man, man, that man. is. Yeah. Wow. That's got to make your truck set up more efficient, I would think. Well, what kind of trucks? Considering that we don't have, so we've probably got maybe 100 to 120 uh, customers on our fertilization program, which we're calling Turf Care RX. Um, okay. And like that. with that, we, cause we, we really started to dive into it like mid last year. Uh, we did it, but we, again, we weren't doing very good. So if we probably started really focusing on it and really start making moves to, to go the right direction in it. And, and with that, so one of the reasons why we don't use the sprays, I mean, you've probably heard of the stories where, you know, a company, I won't name names, but they spray the wrong stuff and they kill 50 yards or you have a Bermuda lawn and a St. Augustine lawn and a Zoysia lawn, and you've got to have the specific chemicals for each. And now we have, as we've talked to a couple of agronomists with Ewing's, um, that have actually set up, helped set up our program where we have pretty much every round is a different t chemical, but it's all granular and it can be used on St. Augustine, Bermuda and Zoysia dependent mm -hmm. on the time of year that you're actually applying. So the idea is we've overlapped where the, the, the chemicals that you can actually use on all three types of grass, 
And we, you know, now I know that we could probably get a little bit better quality um, if we did do the custom blends, but that adds so much more complexity to it. Um, yeah, you've simple. You've simple. Yeah. Are you it, it, it exactly. Is that just done that in the last six months? Uh, I am. It's it's the fact that clients have to understand that you're just because you sign up and you have the first service doesn't mean it's going to go mm -hmm. away. And this is the worst time of the year. I know it takes long. Just five yeah. weeks. You know, so we ask them, hey, give us six months. Let's let us show you that that it will work because pre emergence is really what we've kind of developed the program around. It's really having you on pre emergence and not as much broadcast spraying to just kill, kill, kill. Um, but it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to explain to a client and, and really get them to understand why that's so important. I, I use the, the you know simple analogy is like you know do you do you go buy a new car like do you go change your oil once your engine blows you know and that's it's this general concept like you you got to put the little just standard put the miles in you know and, and that's just what it takes um, you know and typically most of us you know I've used this before most of us don't take a shower when we start to stink ideally you know you shouldn't anyways mm -hmm. wait let's wait a week until it's a problem oh, I got something I got some growth here let me go shower you know but it's uh it's I think it's simplified it a lot across the board for our guys in the field and and the applicators because it's as simple that's when we got dye in the tanks which a lot of guys use it's once the clients see that we did it but more importantly so we can see that we sprayed it because um, it, you know, if you've ever sprayed a lawn, you know that like it's easy to miss if you don't have a way to tell what you've sprayed because it's you know your head's down and you kind of get lost in where you're at, even if you walk in a pattern and stuff. But uh, but anyway, so in terms of the truck setup, um, we don't have a specific truck setup for start, but we run we have ran for the last four years now. Uh, Ram Promaster 1500s, the long body with the uh, high roof. Um, yeah. they're, they're all fully wrapped and I'd be glad to share some okay. photos and stuff that y'all haven't already seen. So you're, them doing somewhere, but... so you're doing the van, vans. No, I love that. That yeah. it, it create, it does, it serves multiple purposes, including being a much bigger billboard than a yeah. traditional truck. Exactly. It, well, and the biggest thing is real. Yeah. I, I mean, real estate's expensive, right? And so I didn't want to have, I wasn't going to have equipment sitting out in, the, out in the open on a trailer. I didn't want to, so uh, kind of backing up real quick, like. When I started this business, I mean, in high school, right? I, you know, or really middle school, you know, it was a truck and trailer, right? Okay. Then I, I moved up to San Marcos and I decided to kind of keep pursuing it a little bit while I was in school, which was kind of a joke. But I always joke and tell people I spent 60 grand touring Texas State. So I got four years of fun oh, and yeah. nothing to show for it, but, you know, about 60 grand in debt. But, yeah. um, you know, luckily this has worked out. The business started really developing when I, I finally said, you know what, screw school, it's not for me. I'm going to go back into this and hit it head on. But what I noticed is, okay, I can back a trailer. I can pull a trailer, but the logs we were servicing, it's kind of tight, right? You typically, you're going to block somebody in yeah. if you're stopped with a truck or trailer. So then yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, how can we go a little smaller um, and reduce not having a trailer so we don't have to worry about, you know, somebody yeah. that, does it when I started scaling the business, I didn't have to worry about somebody getting in that truck and trailer that maybe hasn't been trained properly or uh, doesn't own a back of trailer and gets stuck and has to try to figure out another damage in my stuff or God forbid somebody walks in between the trailer and they don't know it and they run them over. And so we went to a box truck. Um, and it was kind of interesting because I noticed, and, and I don't want to sound like it's uh, it was all my idea, you know, but I noticed the area in the market when I was switching, when I was all truck and trailer, uh, one, nothing was branded, right? It might have been the sign of a truck, but but then I went to a box truck, and there's nobody out here to have box trucks, you know. And then I started seeing some of the bigger companies get the box trucks in our area, because uh, granted, this was six, seven years ago. And then I was like, okay, how can we make this even tighter and smaller, more condensed and more streamlined? Um, and we wanted to go new equipment, clean backup cameras, safety, AC. Yep. So we looked mm -hmm. into ProMasters, and I found that ProMaster is now half the size of a box truck. There's no trailer. We've got the handy ramp, which I heard they went out of business. I don't know why, because that ramp is the best two thousand dollars worth of shit. Um, you know, I mean, literally, you can one hand, hell, even a couple fingers, you can pull that yeah, thing yeah. down, and it goes up and down twenty five times a day. So, um, but anyway, that's wow. kind of how I got into that setup, right? And so, you know, it's it's worked for us, um, and I like it because we've always said, and it's something I've always believed in from a business standpoint is when other people start doing what you're doing, it's kind of a idea to look at maybe changing, you know, or maybe just, you've got to be that person that stands out. that's a little bit different. And we've, we've got a lot of compliments on, you know, like, and, and people will call and ask like, Hey, what's that setup you have in your van? What, how do you, how does this work? And, and it's, it's worked well for us. Um, as long as your guy doesn't drive and through so the drive through. This thing in, 
What, what, what service, service do you use this van for? Uh, basically, mo uh, so lawn care as far as mowing the bullet edge and your uh, fertilization weed control. Uh, the kicker is fertilization weed control. So we can um, we can open the side door and you can actually slide a pallet and fit a pallet of fertilizer in there. It's not Ooh. designed for that much weight. Uh, it will take it. Uh, I mm -hmm. just don't like doing it on a regular basis. And we're typically not using whatever 30 or 40 bags. I can't remember what comes on a pallet. Yeah. We're not going to use that all in one day uh, on the properties we've serviced. Yeah, yeah. And so... You know, we'll load up in there, you know, 20, 25 bags, got a spreader, um, got a backpack sprayer. Um, everything has its place. Um, now, whether the guys put it back in its place, that's a different story. But ideally, <laughs> that's, you know, it, everything's the same. Everything's standardized. So whether it's us training, whether it's us having to repair something, I mean, we've got it down where, you know, so we use uh, equipment defender, which is the stuff that, you know, locks in your equipment and weeders and stuff like that. We've got it down where we know exactly the distance that they're set at so that all vans, even some of our trucks that had them on the side, have that same setup. So I can take a weed eater from one to the next, ideally. We just set all those that fittings is. to be the exact same. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just, it really just comes down to scalability, right? Yeah, well, systematizing, systematizing yeah, that yeah. is key to scaling it. Exactly. Because it gives you the ability to train large numbers of people to. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> And yeah. repairs and everything else, right? You got the same stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been helpful. Like I said, I do see us in the future going to a 2500 for like a van for foot, but. I was going to say, I've had a 2500 and a 1500 van. I have yet to keep a van busy. Anyway, anyway that's better. <laughs> That's right. No, I get it. I, we, but don't get me wrong. We've had some sitting in the yard, and I don't, it's not a good site, but. Uh, we're we're in a season now. I love the busy. ideas of them. I love the ideas of them. That's why I've had them, and we we have one now for plumbing, uh, because again they're they're multi-purpose in that they are a giant billboard. Yeah, hundred percent. They also serve storage. You, they service storage for whatever you need, as opposed to just temporary storage like a truck might, mm -hmm. like you were talked about. Square footage and storage space is expensive. Office space is expensive. Mm -hmm parking spot for a van is much less expensive yeah it's, and that's the thing it's safe and the thing is it's like especially now that we're all electric for our uh, residential like for all we run all electric push mows handhelds everything else even i've mean, got concrete saws that are the yeah, same so, batteries but i want to hear more about that so you yeah, mentioned yeah. some clc landscapes uh, but but you, then you also mentioned greenworks is is all electric what is green so Greenworks Commercial is the brand. company that we, it's the brand of, of equipment we use. Um, and that's okay. all the electric, uh, you know, but the thing with that is, is again, it goes back to scalability and systematizing and standardization is all the batteries fit in, across the board on all of our mowers, all of our handhelds. Uh, we use concrete saws, chainsaws, trimmers. Um, with that being said, the only okay. thing that we have to unload when we get done at the end of the day the guys pull up, we have our fuel tanks, so they'll top off the tank, they have the dumpster on their left, they've got, actually we probably need to move to the right now, think about it, just from the way their side door is. But, um, and then we've got two big tanks, one is for uh, our, our post-emergence spray that we use for only turf crews, and then we got just their typical Roundup spray. Uh, and these tanks stay mixed and they keep cycling, but that way our guys are filling those up, they grab a, it's a milk carton case whatever of the batteries that's how we store them they, they roll out with 20 batteries a day yep. those are the only things the batteries and the water cooling the only things they take out of that van every single day and so they come in to clean it fuel it park it it's done the only thing in the morning they have to get is water ice and, and batteries um you so know that's help been me understand more you uh, got help me understand more you've got you mentioned they get fuel uh -huh. And then back, what is fuel? What do you have left in, in this at, at your company that is still internal combustion engine? Just other the, van. Than the, the vehicle itself. Yeah. Just, just the, the van itself. That's the only. Uh -huh. Everything else at your company is ran off of these battery powered tools. Other we than our mowers. Other than the 52 inch uh, stand on mowers we have, which I've got. Two of those demo, I have two of the demos sitting outside that I use this morning that are electric. Um, and those will be the next. The electric? Switch, so you're, uh, you're, the demoing the, you're demoing the electric, but those are still. Oh, the big ones. That yeah. is that is innovative. That's innovative yeah. right there. And we were and talking, we've been all, talking about the bands. We've been all electric since 
that's what all uh, I mean, it's been at least three years um, for everything but the big mowers. Um, and it's what been. you go to the to all? That's that's a fun one. I like I like to answer this because people think, oh, you're near Austin or whatever, is it? Because you want me to go green. And it's not that I'm a tree hugger or I'm not a tree hugger. It's just it had nothing to do with our decision of going green. I had watched it for a long time. Um, I, I, you know, gone to the, the expo and all that stuff. I knew it was on its way up. I, I, I I'm always try to be. Um, I feel like that's my role as a CEO, you know, and, I, and the owner of the companies. I want to be ahead mm-hmm. of the game. I want to be thinking, you know, very you innovative. Want to be exactly. And yeah. so while mm-hmm. watching all that, one of the struggles that we found was the constant issues of belts, pulleys, carburetors, and all that crap that has that happens with the regular mowers, the standardized mowers. Headache. And so, all of headache. You're giving me mm-hmm. PTSD to having 55 mm-hmm. lawn mowers. <laughs> you say trust. for a carburetor. Yep, yep. That's <laughs> trust me. I hate oh, everything about it. Carburetor. And that's I been that's the thing. And, and Stan, so Stan is also my dad. He's my production manager. Um, he used to be the one in the shop that was fixing that stuff, and it was constant hell. He would have said the same thing. It's PTSD. You even bringing it up. And when I decided to make the switch, right, there was one main reason that I switched. Well, maybe two. But the main reason was the fact is it's battery. It's got a motor and a trigger and a battery, right? It either turns on or it doesn't. It's very simple. It works. It's got higher torque. It's got consistent torque. But it eliminated all those repairs and constant issues that we've ran into with with the mowers and the weed eaters and raw fuel and blah, blah, blah. But some of the nice benefits about it was it was right during COVID, right? When everybody starts working from home. So now we're mowing people's lawns and it's like crazy quiet. And they're like calling and saying, hey, you didn't mow my lawn. I didn't hear your guys. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, check your doorbell camera. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't hear him. I was like, mm-hmm. that's, that's why. Exactly. I mean, literally, I'm, I'm on this zero turn earlier today. And the the rep, the demo guy was literally talk, having a conversation with me while I was mowing. And I'm sitting there and he's standing 30 feet away. And that's just with a, a big yeah. mower, you know, so... I- that was one of the enormous benefits that I found. Uh, I'd say, yeah, in the last three to five years um, in Maui, in Hawaii, uh, mm-hmm. I was staying at the Westin Hotel there, and everything they had was battery powered, so it was so quiet. You didn't, mm-hmm. They didn't interrupt. They were out by the pool. They were out here. They were out there, but they didn't interrupt the gardeners, people out, you know, maintaining the landscape. wasn't interrupting. Because it was all battery, right? And I've respected that even more. Like even right now, uh, I'm in a, I'm in my my office. But my office is a garage. To my left is a is a small garage that goes to the back of my my backyard, and right in front of me is a ginormous garage. And to my right is a bunch of sliding windows, mm-hmm. sliding doors. So even when the blowers and when the mowing crew is here, like it is loud. Oh yeah. So I have a special appreciation for how quiet uh electric is by comparison and to me the noise pollution alone is is a reason to be to, to at least be keeping a very close eye on this on this and as it as it continues i i think that that alone will make it a very much so a, a needed and common i don't know what yeah. to say it'll be co- it'll be common within the industry that battery yeah. powered is, is the, well, it's a lot of people what, are stuck in their ways every time i'm Every time I'm trying, we're trying to film at EJ's house. It's so frustrating whenever oh. these guys come around, and it's so loud, and we have to stop, or we have yep. to ask them to stop. And it's right, right. Hey, yep. EJ, now would be a great time to invest into some battery operated equipment for those crews that come to your house. It's literally been on my list to do for the last two years. It just keeps getting kicked. The can keeps getting kicked. But you know, Chad, what we started do. testing two and a half years ago, right? What we started testing two and a half years ago was autonomous mowers. So yeah. I've had a long, I've had an autonomous yeah. mower in my yard for two years now, maybe three. I think it's three now. And I've had, we've got about 10 of them in operation. Uh, so awesome. we've kind of done, we haven't tested the weed eaters, the blowers yet. That's on the to-do list. And my house is one of the first ones they'll do it at. To your point, Ben, but we have been testing for the last two or three years, autonomous mowers. I've stayed with 10. I initially was real ambitious and thought we're going to have 60 of these in the next two years. We're going to have a hundred in the next X, Y, Z years just to test. And 
honestly, I stayed with just 10 because they're just, they're not, they're not, not reliable there. and consistent enough. They're just not yeah. there yet. They will be, yeah, but they're not there yet. I've been, it's fun. It's, it's so cool you bring it up because that's something I thought about. Um, catch fire or get stolen. Do they get stolen? No, no mine's I... actually broken down right now in a mud pit because they're like a pig. They, it, if he, if he gets into a mud hole and gets stuck, it just makes that mud hole <laughs> size. Uh, but... but no, it, it's got GPS on it and it'll give an alert. Like if it moves outside of its area and it'll tell you exactly where it's at, even when it's completely dead. EJ, I was saying, tell them what happened to the first one you had though. Oh, the first one I ran over. Yeah. Yeah, the first one I literally ran over it. Uh, it was I'm set, assuming it didn't make set it. Set these things up. Uh, I think it could be repaired, <laughs> but that's been one of the other problems. That actually leads me to one of the other key reasons that mm -hmm. we have not gotten more than 10 of them. Right. Is we ran over that one, and we, we started after about a year or year and a half of usage certain things were going wrong with them, especially because like I abuse mine. I wanted to know like, okay, it's going to be in a homeowner's yard. They don't own the thing in some capacity. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but, but, but let's right. pretend like they don't own the thing. Their kids are going to abuse it. It's going to get abused. And so I'm going to treat it as such. And, and I say abuse, it still just got used. I just didn't put yes. it away for storms and all that. <laughs> you you use it so, like anybody else. I, I, I used it the way somebody else would use it, not abusing it, but not by any means babying it. Right. Uh, anyway, it had prob problems with it uh, within a year, two years. Well, nobody can fix it. Yeah. And and the yep. people that say they can fix it, they can't get the parts to do right. it. So the one it's I ran away. over, it was pretty hardy. Like, what, to your point a second ago about the simplicity of electric, they're say, it's a simple machine. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it, there's not a lot to it. And so, no, right. even though I ran over it with my F450 dually, uh, literally it was crossing the driveway as I was driving out and I didn't recognize it. And it got caught right where my dually tires are on the back passenger oh, side. Geez. And yes. I basically, uh, but no, not it was live. fixable if you could get the parts, if you could get the parts, it was actually fixable because okay. there's not a lot to them. They're they're pretty simple, kind of like kind of like other electric powered uh, yeah. weed eaters and and blowers and such. They're simple. Yeah, that's what I was talking with the Greenworks so, rep this morning. Was the um, the ability to like uh, we have we've had some issues with their twenty ones, right? They call it commercial. They're my guys call them Fisher Price mowers, um, and so we've. Uh, yeah. We've ended up, you know, and, and then luckily they're to your warranty. We, we've had, I mean, I don't know how many we've had replaced, but they finally came out with an upgraded true commercial 22 inch. And I'm excited to get my hands on it. Uh, I think next week. And um, point is, but it's also, they're going to have parts for it where, you know, they're hub wheel motors, they're direct drive motors, some uh, uh, blades. And so it, it will actually allow us to be able to fix when we need to. But again, I mean, that's why a lot of me, hell, well, they had trouble getting dealer stuff. And part of the reason I found out, because I looked at being a dealer just to get like VIP status to, you know, get what I needed. Mm -hmm. Well, most dealers make their money in repairs. So they're like, why, why, why want to go electric when, uh, you know, and, and a lot of them for a long time, they, they're throwaway. They're not meant to be. And then mm -hmm. you have guys that are used to working on the car bridge and something else. Now they're trying to figure out how do I program? You know, you're hiring a whole different talent and caliber person. To do something that's yeah. yeah not normal. So I think it's you know it's gonna so take some time. Who, but... who, who are who are the dealers? Who are the people that are repairing these? So well, for the while they've all just been throwaway. But I mean, the, their big mowers can be repaired. But uh, the dealers that I work with now, uh, anyways, locally, it's called Telus oh, Equipment. Wow. They're a big John Deere uh, John Deere dealer. Um, they just picked okay. up Greenworks um, here locally. But there's yeah. quite a few dealers all over the country, um, and they're making a pretty good. There makes pretty good uh, steps forward, but, um, you know, it's just the dealers aren't used to it either. You know, uh, we've had issues with three different dealers and it, I realized it wasn't all the dealer either, right? Some of it's, it's the, I mean, it's, yeah, it's really know. Greenworks. Um, it's all and, new. Yeah. All new. It's, yeah. So it's, Greenworks as a company, mm -hmm. Greenworks actually developed or built these, right. these pieces of equipment or are they a supplier or a distributor of mm -hmm. this equipment? Yeah, they, they design and build. Yeah. And then, yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. They're a manufacturer. Exactly. Yeah.
Yeah, so it's, I mean, they're just like, and so I found out today, Greenworks actually built, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, Greenworks builds all the steel's battery equipment. So, I was going to ask about just, that. Well, That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I was, no, just I had it with it. They put that out the side door. Yep, exactly. So, it, it's been interesting. I, I, I've been pretty happy in the powers there for, you know, electric. But, but to me, you know, going back to like the robotics, I, I've looked at it. I do think it's pretty, it's a really neat idea uh, for the larger commercial market stuff that's very programized, right? You know, like a big soccer field or even a golf course I've heard, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't, I, I didn't see a real board, but, but even like the ball picker, right? On the driving range, I play a lot of golf and I was like, mm, that's, that's smart. Even though that was, you know, that was my job when I was, when yeah, I was, yeah. you know, um, when, when but, we see them there, that's when we'll know that they're coming for residential and commercial, but more I'm thinking. When you see them like you're talking on the large fields, large mm-hmm. areas, when you start seeing them prevalent there all over the place, that's when you're yeah. going to know that they're they're getting closer to residential and smaller commercial. And I think there's been a company, and I can't remember, there's a lot of companies doing it, but I, I've seen one company that is getting into the, uh, I don't know what they call it, like micro geo coordinates or something, essentially where it's supposed to be accurate from a geo location. Uh, within like inches yeah um mm-hmm. and, and you mm-hmm. can essentially draw on a map right in the program and it's programmed so all you have to do is have a guy take the mower set it on it will mow while you're something weed eating um hell i even saw this thing mm-hmm. it's a weed eater it's like a robotic ai weed eater again it's all test phase but yeah um but these things are you know thirty thousand dollars now again thirty thousand dollars you get a year's use out of it i mean hell that's an employee you know and and you get something that's gonna every day turn on constantly so mm-hmm. oh, it's coming one way or another, the robotics is coming. Hundred uh, percent. But you're exactly right. That's another. That's another key thing is because it's cost. It's not cost effective enough. I think I actually did the exercise to replace Chorby's mowing. So Chorby mows yards, mows mm-hmm. three or four thousand yards a week, residential, all two and three and four thousand square foot yards in North Texas, mostly mm-hmm. North Dallas, uh, and to put a, a robo mower or an auto mower on each one of those yards would cost like $5 million worth of auto mowers. Yeah. And you, those you auto can't, mowers you... would be obsolete. Even if they work for two years with no repairs needed or three yeah. years or five years, they got it. They're supposed to work five years. And if they work five years, the economics kind of work. But yeah. even if they do that, they're obsolete in two years. Right. And the yeah. only way that I could see it so, working is that mower has to be mowing all day long. It can't stop and stay on one property. Right, it would have to service right. thirty clients every single day. I mean, hell, it'd be one of those things where if you could get, you know, almost. No, I agree. It's just not. But, but like you said, the idea is, yeah, I shouldn't have to go put it up for a better fence. I shouldn't have to go put in all this stuff. But if I can go there, have a guy managing the, the you know, the actual lawn itself, managing the mower, he's out there on the program, and then he goes out and weed eats, mm-hmm. and then picks it up or drives it back into the into the trailer or wherever that's it goes, that's goes that's to the next one. Absolutely. But once that happens, it's gonna be it's gonna wake the industry up. Because and that's the thing is I don't I don't like being behind the gun. I don't like being or being behind the eight ball. You know I want to be ahead of it, which I guess can be dangerous from a business standpoint. But there's a lot of people in this world that have gotten very it's very successful because they weren't afraid to take that little bit extra step of being innovative. Um, because it is happening yeah. whether we like it or not. And like we talked about earlier, a lot of these guys. People look at us with like, well, you know, electric mowers and like, electric, yeah, what, what a loser. You know, and I'm like, okay, come look at my, you know, come look at my books, you know, come look at what we're doing. Come look at our efficiency. And once we give them a couple weeks of the guys that are actually enjoying it and they they start to adapt to it and they realize one of the mowers are quite a bit lighter. Uh, the equipment is too, but it's so much quieter. You don't have the smell of gas. And now our, our prime target employee is not the typical Hispanic market of labor, right? It, and it's not the guys who are seasoned that are used to it in our area. We're getting students that are, and again, maybe they're Hispanic right. students, it doesn't matter, but we're getting students that are not necessarily seasoned. They don't want to come over here in a, what's kind of known in the industry to be maybe a little bit dirty and, and rough around the edges. Now we are very clean. They can have an AirPod in safely and still be able to hear what's around them. Obviously not both. But they don't have the smell of gas. They don't have this constant. Right. It's just a different feel, right? It's clean, and it's it's almost to the um, you know because again we got Texas State, which is like forty four thousand students. 
And so we've been really leveraging some of that um, because that can make decent money, especially mm -hmm. if, you know, if they're on like a P for P model or something like that. And as a student, so. Right. Yeah. So Chad, do you drive a Tesla? I don't know. I, I would, I would like, I don't know if I don't want but I, I definitely, <laughs> the few that I'm driven, I, I, they're cool. They're fun. Um, I don't know. New C8 they're Corvette fun. before I did that. So. Nice. Or plane. I, 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 uh, I, I, that was kind of just a, yeah, I was kind of just teasing you in some ways, but obviously oh, the know. Tesla plans down there, the Giga, the Giga oh, yeah. factory, and we're talking about electric. So I had to kind you of know plug that wild. in there just to see. So have you, have you ever been driven by a Giga factory or one of those the Tesla plants? I'm driven by the plant. I think they're in East Austin on, on yeah. the, what is it, 183 or something like that? Yep. Yeah. So my wife was driving one time, and, and uh, I, well, say she's driving. Well, she was driving, I was riding. And I said, okay. And I asked her, how fast she was? She's doing, you know, it's on the fastest toll road or road in America. She's doing like 95. Yeah, like 85. Right? Yeah. And yeah. she's got a, yeah, she's got a yeah. floor to the pedal to the floor. But anyways, so right when this, the building started, I started just, I timed it. Doing 95 miles an hour from the time she started at the beginning of the Gigafactory to the time we ended. It was 48 seconds. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, 95 yeah. miles an hour for 45 wow. seconds. That's how big that damn building is. It just blows my mind. And then they're building like another one next to it. So. But anyways, that's it's three inches. I love everything about it. I, love basically, what I mean, you're literally building a city. Uh, SpaceX is literally building a city in South South Texas, South. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, down like Corpus I area that, or I whatever it is. That's, but Browns, like even South Brownsville. That, yeah. That's a yeah. I think that that's a future, a future big yeah. hub. Uh, you know, fast forward 50 years or whatever, that's a much bigger city than it is or an unrecognizable city, especially if SpaceX continues to mm -hmm. uh, innovate into space it, it, at, yep. at scale that creates an entire economy down there that doesn't currently exist. My 100%. grandma and, owns a couple of acres in Brownsville and she's been wanting to sell for years. <laughs> and I keep telling her, wait, just wait. Yeah, yeah, not absolutely. Sell. How, how many acres did you say, Ben? Two. Two. By the way, your speaker is quiet today, so it's really easy to speak over you. I kind of like it. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> I don't like that. I'm going to start yelling at you guys. That's funny. It's awesome. Uh, uh, shoot, I was going to ask you something. Well, to that oh, point, I will say that. I was going to ask you. Sorry. Who else in your area do you know that is all electric? doing the same services that you're doing nobody so that's that's the other cool part um i've talked to you know there's a couple guys that might have like a dewalt like you know something they bought from home depot or something but uh even some of the bigger commercial guys they don't do it um brightview i know is starting to adopt some greenworks commercial products but it's more in austin um and it's more on the uh i don't know what you'd call it but you know like for example i got a buddy up in des moines iowa that uh manages some of the uh, Facebook um, uh, data centers and, you know, they, they keep all the equipment on site at Facebook. Like that's, that's part of that contract. And so on, on those like that, where they require to maybe be quiet or be green or whatever it may be. Um, I know Brightview is using some of that, but they're definitely adopting into it more. Uh, but in terms of my area directly, which is 30 miles each way, I haven't found anybody and I've looked pretty hard. So I, again, well, I think people are stuck uh, in their ways. It, I, I just decided, uh, Chad, I'd like to come down to y'all's facility and do a site visit and record. Yeah, love to have you, man. Basically, basically do a shop oh, we tour. Need to, we need to do that with the T-Pig tour later this year in the fall when we're down in Austin. There you go. Well, I can tell you this is the nicest room in my office, but this is our main, main entry. Now. It's, it's not bad. It gets the job done, you know. Good, I'm sure y'all been to a lot of lawn care facilities we we do the same so so most of our offices are garages of different of different sizes and it even mm -hmm. closets ben loves to joke this he he once had a closet it was not, not a joke <laughs> well it's not a joke it was a closet it was, it was closet. literally it was a closet enough. but then you, you make it sound you know it was a walk-in closet <laughs> it what was walk -in. a squeeze in mm -hmm. They, yeah, yeah. The difference was, is, can, it did, did it have, have its own lights? It rode the line, but <laughs> yes. barely, yes. <laughs> and it, but it did not have windows. Yeah, well, see, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it, yeah it's a closet. Uh, it rode the line, but it rode the line between being big enough 
to be in office uh, and small enough to make fun of it. So that's why well, there I, you go. I just harp on yeah, it. He loves it. <laughs> but I just love to think of him working in a little closet. That is kind of funny. I don't even actually remember where it was or what it was because it didn't well, play the last got pictures. Football. You've got pictures. <laughs> you need to post those. Absolutely. I'd love to see it. Where you start yeah. in the closet. <laughs> he came out. Not cool, man. Oh, not cool. man. Let's not go down more. more. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I prefer well, yeah. That. So what, what was the investment <laughs> like going seriously? What was the investment like going from uh, internal combustion engines all to over to all electric? Uh, initially, it was about $35,000. Just we started just three crews. Um you know, it really surprisingly wasn't that bad. I did the math from a total, like what a startup cost was per van. Um, and it's also because we're not using the big stand on mowers because those are not cheap. I mean, a 52 inch stand on electric mowers at $25,000. Um, now when you calculate the ROI on it, it's actually cheaper than let's say like my V rides. Um, but it's the batteries are actually the, some of the most expensive part. I mean, I think we've got right now in the office or in the shop, we've got $30,000 in batteries. Um, and a battery mm-hmm. wall, and I had to put in nine new 20 amp breakers to run, you know, to, be able to charge it. Um, but the equipment itself is very comparable to what you'd buy in the uh, like, so take the battery out, right? The equipment itself is actually comparable to any commercial equipment. Um, even the big mowers, right? Because those batteries in those big mowers, they got a five year warranty and, and 2,000 hours, but um. You take the battery out. Let's say you had to buy new one. It's like seven thousand dollars. So, you know, you start oh, geez, seven to ten. So you take that out of it. Now you're just a little bit more than a regular gas mower. Um, so, and, and that's one of the things I looked at it too. Was you know, there's just well, we already talked about being simple, but like even the big mower. I was looking for like all the little extra, you know, pulleys, the locks, the gear, and there's just not. There's not a lot of mechanisms, and so. But from an investment standpoint, yeah, if I just on handhelds and push mowers, we were about 30000 all in at the beginning. We've made probably another $15,000 uh, between some batteries and some additional handhelds. Then we got some chainsaws, some pole saws, uh, which we don't do a lot of trick trimming. We do need them. Um, pretty much anything we can reach from the ground. Uh, I got concrete saws. I would say all in right now, we're close, probably pushing sixty. 60 grand and and but now so this is another thing that i think you'll appreciate is the so when we calculated out i went and kind of added it up i said okay from a savings from, from time and from downtime and all this other stuff what it works to be is is about like i budgeted it to be about i could replace all this every two years but what it breaks down from the standpoint of okay we know how long a, a weed eater that doesn't want to start takes right it might take you that all two minutes. Let's say two minutes of property times times twenty properties times three crews or five crews or ten or whatever. That cost, if I took that and put it into an electric savings from you know it, it either works or doesn't, pays for this equipment in less than eight months. Just the time savings. Um, not obviously wow. there's caveats to that, but that to me was like a huge eye opening and made all sense in the world. And the idea is like maybe I'm not going to get rid of it in two years, but I could. Because I can, I can budget for it. So, and the yeah. batteries get more than enough. Like you get more than enough life. Because obviously, there's a certain uh, don't the batteries, they get less and less. They last less and less as time mm-hmm. goes on. But you're saying you get two solid years out of the battery before you, you know, have to replace it. I'm I'm getting decent decent use out of it for the batteries that are pushing two years, but they got a two year warranty. And I've been, don't worry, I've been riding that warranty train as much as I can, you know, as it should, and mm-hmm. pay good money for it. But, but uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're seeing about 80% charge rates on the stuff that's a year and a half old, the batteries. So the batteries, like I said, I mean, these are four or $500 a piece, but they can be interchanged with any of our equipment. The only thing that they won't work on is those big stand on motors, um, just because they have a right. big, you know, integrated battery. But so it's been, it's been fun, right? And like I said, and, and you know, it's interesting. Obviously, we've talked a lot about the maintenance side and like what we've done on that. But we, to kind of put it just for reference um, for any other viewers on here. So like we'll do this year, we should do about a little over a million dollars in, in turf and lawn care, right? So it's not a huge operation, but it's not a small. Um, 
but yeah. are go ahead i was going to say yeah but you're doing a billion dollars using all battery power yes yeah, for the most good. part i'd say about yeah, 80 80 90 percent of that yeah it's it's been it's been good you know and and that's again it's wonder, including our trust there right i wonder how i wonder i mean there's not many big bigger companies out there period not Any doing specific doing yeah that. Well, and that's, again, I think we got a head start, which is good. Right, right. And that's, but the other thing to, for reference, like, so like, for example, last year we did 2.31 million total. Um, and we did about 700 or six, 680 or so in maintenance and turf. And the rest of it was design built construction. So our design built construction leads the pack in terms of takes a lot of our time and we do a lot and we make a lot more revenue with it. And this year, our goal is I think three, three, two. Um, and you know, we should do a little, almost 2 million and design build construction uh, as well. So it's kind of going back to that full circle. Design build construction. Is uh, all design build construction in house? Is it mostly all, or is it a lot of subcontractors or? We're using more subs now, uh, specifically for like concrete hardscapes, which my guys can do some of that stuff. But what I found is our guys are either, they're good at it, but they're slow, nothing against them. They're just slow because that's something they do every day. Yeah, where yeah. I can hire a mason that does this thing, put up some walls that are beautiful like that. And they're cheaper. I'm making off that. We did $230,000 last year in subcontractor. In the year prior, we did 57000 And the margins on it is yeah. better. It takes some of the liability off of yeah. me. Plus, now it's almost like work. You know, I mean, you know how stuff work. It's like now I just turned a two, an average of two crews per landscape. Now I'm almost like I'm running three. <laughs> Um, and this year it's almost like I'm going to be running four because our goal is to hit 500,000 in sub work. Um, and we hope to be doing pools, designing and, and doing those by the end of this year. Um, you know, and that's a whole nother, um, caveat, not caveat, but another yeah. spin is I, I've learned it's, you know, there's a couple of sayings that I was like talking about is like, I've learned it's the whole saying of, well, got you here. won't always get you there. Or the one that says, you know, I got to a million by saying yes. So you get to 10 million by saying no. And really yeah. defining what you do and how you do it is kind of been the part where like we used to be the lawn care guys that just the mud blow and go guys that we provided a good service it wasn't anything special but we were providing for the cheapest the clients that wanted the cheapest service and kind of willy-nilly you know we just we were consistent but it's oh i don't want service anymore like i want to skip this it was, it was, a, it was a battle and then we were doing mid to high construction that was awesome and we're you know we're building out 50 80 hundred fifty thousand dollar average projects but then they we weren't maintaining those same clients and i said this just doesn't make any sense and so we started about six months ago started looking into what we call now our green flex subscription mowing and essentially all it is is basically it's 32 visits okay. um, a year it's a one monthly cost and we decided to bill up front so they sign up today they're going to get billed for the whole month a little bit proration if you know it's a little bit into the month but then they pay that same rate. Yeah, whether they're getting four services this month or two, bank, but it's all based on seasonality. So we're trying to prevent the client from wanting to call, needing to skip, thinking that they're paying for it for something they don't need, like in the winter. We just tell them, hey, look, it's all built in, right? And at the end, if there's a little difference, we're going to either charge them the difference if they did cancel or if or we're going to give them a little bit back if they didn't receive all the services. But what it's done is now we're offering a service because we're the professionals, right? When you call me, you're not calling me. You shouldn't be saying, hey, I, I want... Because I asked my team, I said, when they call, are they asking specifically, I want bi-weekly service? Or can I get weekly service? And it's typically not that. They're just looking for lawn care. So when we offer, we say, hey, look, it's one service. Hey, it's this program. You you pay us to make sure your lawn looks good. This is how it goes. It's going to fluctuate in the season. The idea is your lawn should never look bad. And and you're going to pay one monthly cost. And you can add on, you know, playing bed care for $13. Or, you know, it's all based on square footage and stuff. But what that does is now we're starting to get into the market of the clients who actually, excuse my language, but give a shit about their yard that are willing to pay and they yep. start to have a value. They add value on how their large yeah, yeah. yard looks, which is now crossing, starting to breed and cross paths with the services and the clients we actually service from a standpoint of design built construction, which is where we go in from that. Yeah. We try to add to the end what we call our aftercare program which is essentially we'll warranty a lot of their items, like plants, living items. But the, we say for the life of the, for the, basically for life, with it does say within 10 it's years, but if they, exactly. And they can't skip it, they can't stop it and come back in a year and say, 
but like, you know, the idea is I got eyes on the service. So if you want us to, you know, warranty your grass, yeah, I'll warranty your whole yard. And 10 years from now, if something dies, I'll come replace it. But you got to have our turf care and you got to have our mowing services. And we have what's called WaterWise, which we do every other month. We come out and check the irrigation. But the, we use the smart controllers with, you know. But anyways, it helps kind of build that little white picket fence around them. You know, it's kind of like uh, Tommy Mello says, if you're familiar with who that is, you know. And so, um, uh -huh. yep. you know, build the, the service agreements, you know. And, and it's, uh, but no contracts. But the idea is it's, they forget about it. And that's helped us. Um, we've lost some clients, but when you do the math, and I've told my offices, because, you know, and granted, I, I love that they're looking out for it, but they're worried, like, oh, we're going to lose clients. They, they canceled. I said, look, they canceled because we aren't, we aren't making money with them anyway. We're losing money. And I have to explain that. I said, I, I get it, but I also did the math. I could lose out of, we had like 400 or 400, four, about 400 active service clients. I could lose, I think it was like 38% of those clients and break even if the rest of them went to the service. And I think we've maybe lost like five, like five actual clients total. Um, yeah. And so yeah. it, it just, I mean, it's basically print money. Right. Right. It's exactly it. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, we, it, it's so important. It's, you know, you talk about prices, raising prices. It's, I just had a financial consultant I work with in the industry, um, his name's Jim Houston. He's real big in the design build industry for financials and uh, uh, budgeting all that stuff. Anyway, so he was in how live this, oh, what is today? Thursday? Yeah, he's in Tuesday or Monday. And, um, you know, we were talking about it. What we've learned is, and what I've learned and you probably are aware of, is a lot of the guys that, you know, are, are stuck at that four or $500,000 mark or whatever it may be. It's not a, it's not always an efficiency problem. It's not necessarily always an operational problem. It's a pricing problem. And people don't realize it, what it they need to charge. And they don't, yeah. they're scared to. And I tell everybody, he's like, man, I can tell you, I, that's my favorite time of the year now. I used to be the worst time of the year, you know, but. Even with, even with uh, all of the YouTube and all of the talk about pricing what you're worth and pricing better and da, 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 da. The home services industry is still way behind as a whole. Lawn and landscapes is even far behind for home services. Uh standards it's just it's, it's it's really under it's an underpriced undervalued industry and you know on so many levels we're the last that come in like from a landscaping standpoint we're the last ones that come in it's also a client will value them paying for maid service inside more than they're going to value paying for a maid service outside right because they're inside more often i understand it but it's the same point that we've made the decision to get into pools and the reason why it's not okay. one, we, we can design them. We wow. do them. We have a very strict process for construction design build, which is, you know, we've had to develop and stop perfect, but we're, we're better than most in our area. Um, and I, I'd even argue we're better than most for residential process and planning for probably, I mean, definitely our area, maybe even larger, but point being is it's taken yeah. some time to get there. But what I found was again, landscaping, we're always the last guys that, that, all of the budget of the wife builds a new house, they build a new house and the wife needs a bigger closet or the husband wants an extra garage and, and the budget gets overdone. Well, it's the same concept is that always comes from landscaping. So, and then people undervalue landscaping and their lawn care, but more so for in this, in this point is landscaping. You know, we go out on site and they're like, oh, I want to do this, that, and the other. Uh, well, you have a budget, you have an idea in mind, which you want to spend. They're like, oh, I want to spend like 10 grand. I'm like, you can't get this for 80 grand, you know? And, and that a lot of it comes down to us educating our clients. But the reason why I wanted to get into pools is nine out of 10 people finance their pool. And the majority of our pool builders around here, they don't do any type of landscaping. They'll design it, but then the client's like, hey, oh, where's the landscape? Oh, no, we don't do that. You know, mm -hmm. and then they'll destroy the irrigation. And honestly, just us say, hey, guess what? We also know irrigation. I, I could sell, I bet you I could sell pool just because of that, even though it's not rock side, it's stuff hard. But now I get to design the pool, the landscaping, the whole outdoor living section and do it before they go to the bank and say, I need financing versus them spending $150,000 on a pool, adding some stuff. Now they spend 160, it comes out of landscaping. Now we're going to look, there's no more money. You're seeing them building and, yeah. and updating and upgrading yeah. their landscaping because you're able to sell and get, they're able to go to the bank and get money from landscaping as well. 
it's and, yeah, and it's and because a lot of people aren't going to spend the money. In my opinion, I've seen a lot of people don't really like to finance landscape, and I can understand to a point why. Now getting out there living, right? It's like doing a kitchen, right? Okay, I want to. They see the value in the financing, but with a pool, because it's typically a higher ticket item, it's also an investment. It's going to last a lot longer. It, it seems a little bit more prominent because not everybody has one hundred fifty thousand dollars just sitting around. Hell, I, I know I don't. The bank owns me and owns my pool. But at the same time, you know, I can get in ahead of time and say, hey, okay, your pool's 130 and we're going to budget. This is designed. We're going to add another 50 for landscaping. Instead of them building that home, their $30,000 pool, getting a loan for 150 and realizing that, shit, I'm $30,000 short. And then now, guess who gets to, guess who loses? Uh, DLC yeah. landscaping. We don't get to build that beautiful landscape yeah. people wanted because they didn't plan for it because they didn't know. And she didn't know any better. And like, it's just, a, I mean, you know how it is. I mean, you know, I just ordered another truck. Yeah, I've had my truck for longer than normal, but I just ordered another truck. It's $94,000. Luckily, I'm going to sell mine for make like 50 for it. But point is, people finance, people are used to it. I don't necessarily like the financed customers for the smaller projects because typically it's, those are the ones that, I don't want to say needy because if you pay the money, I do, I, I tell our guys, like, you have the right to be. Particular, but that, but you, have word the same, use, but... you have to do the same amount of work for a two thousand dollar job as you do for a twenty thousand dollar job. That's exactly. the problem. Uh, you, a, lot, a lot of the built-in uh, startup, you know, costs are the same. Mm -hmm. Whether exactly. it's two thousand, twenty thousand. That's why people don't understand either when we say, "Hey, you know, there's this price." And I, again, with Jim Houston, we just figured yeah. out we know our name. Rate. I know that it costs me for one day. I got a, my break even is about nineteen hundred and seventy six dollars and some cents for one landscape crew to roll out for a full day. That's before I add materials or make any kind of money, and and that's right. you know granted if everything goes right, and people don't really yeah. understand that, nor do they value it. And I don't think it's intentional; they just don't value it because it's they or they don't realize again. It's like well, your AC goes out. People pay a fortune for that because guess what? Your AC's out, especially in Texas. It's hot as hell. I'm sweating. I want Fix your problem. You're paying. Yeah. Yep. And, yep. you know, and so we're That's trying to get people Shoreby, to see value gonna, more. Yeah. At Shoreby, yeah. we're going to offer all those services, in the, basically in the same concept, but across the entire board, you know, your yeah. HVAC service, all, all of all of it's, all of it's necessary. I always like to fly into a, 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 a suburban or urban area, whether it's Dallas, Fort Worth or Austin, or Houston or anywhere. My favorite is to fly into Las Vegas personally, but that's it's just my insane. personal preference. But I love flying in. I love flying in. You see all of those rooftops and all of the potential value in maintaining those rooftops from top to bottom, whether it's the grass in the yard, whether it's the HVAC system, whether it's the roof itself, whether it's the 15 or 25 year remodel of the bathroom and kitchen, whether it's the flooring, whether it's the windows. You name it, I just I I, I love a well maintained property property yeah. and that I, I see value in being able to bring that convenience to homeowners. Yeah. And and I see I you know for like, me personally a, going like so and sorry there's a little lag here so I'm not intentionally trying to cut you off. Um, the, you know to me like that was kind of the the one thing we were missing the only thing we were missing was pool building. Because it's like when people call and they call landscaping, right? And people are like, oh, what does CLC last call? You know, what does the CLC stand for? And they're like, was that like Chad, Larry, something? And I was like, no, it's actually used to be Chad's Lawn Care, which is where CLC came from. And I wanted to get in landscaping. What I'm finding now is people, and it, a lot of it comes down to the marketing too, but people call for landscape. Well, we're doing a lot more outdoor living now. We're doing a lot more structures. And so it's kind of like we talked about the slogan, live life outside, right? And so it's, you know, something that is, but we want to go do everything outside, right? I want, I, and I want to go tell people anything outside. Like, I mean, I, we do, we pour driveways for people, right? We, we can do it all. I just don't want to build a house personally. Cause and if I built houses, it'd be multi-million dollar homes. I would do 10 or 15 a year and make good profit margin, have less headache. And people that value the fact that they value very particular detail, which I'm pretty OCD myself, but you know, I, I see it from a from a business standpoint. You can go Dion Horton style, right? Just build millions of homes. But that's how I do it. So your standpoint, I like that you're doing it all, right? But uh, you know, it's for me. It's 
that just sounds like a headache. But you know, it's it's uh, <laughs> it is a headache, no doubt, no doubt. It's about the it, it is a headache. Like I, I some of those services I don't want to offer. Like housekeeping, housekeeping to me sounds like an absolute headache. Uh, I mean, I I come from mowing. And, you know, it's one thing for somebody to get real particular about this spot or that spot, but you get inside to somebody's house. Oh, God. I can only yeah. imagine. Yeah. And that's, and that's, imagine. I always joked, I said, man, if I started a housekeeping business, they'd have to wear body cameras so they can't call me and say, hey, you know, you stole this. I'm like, check this out. Look, this, this is what they did all day. And, and, you know, it's just, but to me, it's, it goes back to from a, uh, I love the psychology of like sales, right? And so this is one thing we've talked to our sales team is especially for like a design build standpoint. We've started shifting with the technology we can utilize, actually designing on site. We we'll spend 30 to 45 minutes walking the site and we'll go sit down and ask me, would you mind go sit down at your kitchen table or sit down at the you know back porch or whatever and we'll actually work up a general design and give you some rough numbers. And what that's allowing us to do in real time. is, yes, in real time, but more importantly, from a psychological standpoint, when they allow us in their home, they don't even realize, but they just took that big ass wall we've been trying to chip down and they just removed it. Because when somebody lets you in their home, that's their space. That's their, you know, and it, it, it's not a way, you know, it's not a complete win, but it definitely helps because I think, again, Tommy Mello says it. He says most, the best sales are the most sales are the ones made at the, at the, uh, on the couch or the kitchen table. You know, you're, you're in their personal space. And so from a housekeeping standpoint, you're also in their personal space. People are going to be very more or much more particular. I mean, hell, I find myself in my makeup, I'm just like wiping, you know, just to see. And I know because I'm in the service business, like, dude, you're going to miss stuff. And she does a pretty good job, but I find myself doing it, right? Because it, it, we want the value and we want to feel the value of what we are paying for. Um, and sometimes that has to be, you know, like, I'm going to go touch it, <laughs> you know? And so, but I can imagine the headaches with that. I've got, <laughs> I've, I've run, I've run so far. Somebody said, "Hey, you gotta go go inside somebody's house." So, real quick, I want to go. I know we're we're a little bit over, but I want to ask you one more quick question regarding your journey. A little bit about your journey, your input up to this point uh -huh. on building and leading a team, uh, and also clearly, you're you've done mastermind groups. You've talked about a, a gentleman that's helping you do some financial planning. Uh, so your, your journey, building a team and seeking counsel and growing. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's just, it could be a long winded answer, but to, you know, it's, yeah. it's simply put, I think what I've learned over the last 10, 12 years and really over the last four to five years, right. It really didn't start until I joined my first mastermind group, which was the service autopilot Academy. Um, and then I was joined in the okay. Academy elite with y'all probably heard the name Jonathan Potosha who started that and service autopilot and who has city Tuck, which is a whole other thing, you know, yeah. in the, yeah, the, the, lawn, the lawn chair, the lawn, I know the lawn chair millionaire quite well. Actually, I have dinner yep. with him in a few weeks. Uh, I try know. to have dinner awesome. with him twice a year. But I remember yeah. when he started service autopilot Academy and he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> yeah. I was a direct competitor of City Turf. He didn't let uh so right. I think one of those the service autopilot academies is or academy you yeah, don't we, have direct yeah. competitors and so correct. He, yeah, and, and it was cool. Hard time that he, he wouldn't let me in academy formally. Smart guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh you know, and that's and that's yeah. what what but it's so cool, you know, and like and being within the academy league, we got to really know I got to know him, I got to know a lot of these guys in the industry really, really well. And it, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's kind of corny or whatever the world would be, but it, it's weird. It's, I mean, it's almost like a, it's a, like a family, right? Yeah. I get to know these guys. Some of these guys have become pretty good friends. Like I'm going to Destin. We did last year. We're going to Destin again this year with like 10 of them, right? The, the guys and their wives, like guys that I've known, and they're all in this industry, um, all over the country. And right. what this has done, you know, like I've been to one of the guys had a baby and, and Jonathan and, and his wife, Tiffany, they threw a baby shower at their house in, in Dallas. You know, we went up there for a baby shower, you know, and it's just, but to know that like this guy is like, he doesn't have to be like buddy, buddy with us, but I can call him right now. And if I needed help, he'd, he'd pick it up, you know, and, and it's just, and the dude's probably worth freaking close to a billion dollars, I'd imagine, you know, and so but he's just another normal guy. But one of the things I always asked him, I said, man, what, what did it take? Like, you know, it's like every entrepreneur asks, like, what did it take to get you there? And the thing that I've heard the most and he said the most was people, you know, you surround yourself with the right people. You really focus on the people. 
the leaders and stuff. And that's still, that's, there's a lot within that, right? You got to get the right people. And, and I'm still learning that. I've got uh, Natalie, which Ben is uh, met. I, DJ, you might have met her. And she's the one that deals with people. She's good with people. And I'm good with people, but I needed somebody else that can do that other than just me. And that's been a big, a big point of really trusting and empowering other people to be able to make decisions for you in the best interest of the company. Um, but yeah. that's been, that's one of them, right? The other thing, even that's really made the biggest century, the biggest difference is really understanding your financials. And I would say, I still don't have it down perfectly, but you know, I mean, there was a point in time about six years ago that I was selling at a two and a half percent loss and I had no idea. And I went to one of Jason Cup's financial yeah. roundtables, and it was an eye opener. And and it's taken a little bit, you know, you change your prices, change your ways, operations, whatever. And before you know it, you know, you realize that okay, we're finally building something here, you know. And that's that's been uh, that was extremely important. But uh, you know, I think so. And, you know, the last thing I would say too is that I've really learned is so again, my dad works uh, works with me, you know, technically for me, but you know, I say we we all work together, right? And so he ran a trucking company for a long time, and then he he's more hard headed and like, you know, it's like, oh, I can do it. I can do it. And it's like, just cause you can, doesn't mean you should. And so anyways, when he retired and decided I was done with that, I need some egg trust. That's when he came on with me. He's been with us for about seven years. But one thing he's always said, you know, that I mean, I see a lot of these guys that we talk to, they want to start a business. They want to do something. And I was talking to my sister about it just the other day. The, the thing that holds them back is the fact they never take that first step forward. And sometimes you just got to put one foot in front of the other, yeah. but you have to stay focused because again, we're all ADD. You said at the beginning of this call, I'm ADD, I'm ADHD. And I was diagnosed when you actually had to go sit in a room for three days in a row and do this little computer yeah. thing and models. And you didn't have, didn't have just an iPod, right? I've been on medicine since I was in kindergarten. But point being is it's the people they, they wanted to see the next big bright shiny object. And I'm guilty of it. But yeah, then they yeah. want to jump. They want to go do something else. And they're like, no, you you got to stick with this because you're going to have the ebbs and flows. But it's not about making that one smart decision. It's making a bunch of little good decisions and a couple bad ones along the way. But continuing to make those little small ones. And then you'll look back in 10 years or 20 or 30 and say, damn, we built something, right? And so it's just, it's interesting. People are afraid to make that first step. And that's even like employees. I'm like, dude, you can't keep bouncing and bouncing and bouncing around. It's not going to come overnight. But if you keep putting in the work and the time and you're with a company you believe in and that you can stand behind and understand what it takes and what everybody else around you is doing, and you might actually be a part of something down the road. Now, if you want to go be a business owner, more power to you. There's a lot more to it than people see, as we all know, but it doesn't mean you can't do it, mm -hmm. right? And so anyways, that that's kind of the, the sum of that piece that I feel like, and I still don't have it figured out. I mean, we're, you know, I'm learning every day. I feel like I always say, if you're not learning, you're losing, you know? And so I, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, that's what I said. That's why I, that's why I ended that question by saying so far on your journey so far, because like you said, we're, we're all learning. We're learning every day. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That's, uh, it's been important to me. And the last thing I'd say too, it's, you know, like I've been working to get my pilot's license and, uh, taking a little longer than I'd like. But something I've always loved, I've always loved aviation, whatever. And uh, I've always loved engineering, everything about it. And and one thing they talk about all the YouTube videos and stuff that I've seen that my wife is probably sick and tired of watching, but she knows more than most about mm -hmm. tunnel boring machines yeah. and, and airplanes, you know. But, um, <laughs> you know, we uh, one thing I've noticed like in the pilot aviation industry is, is they talk about proficiency and they talk about how like, okay, like your checklist, right? They say these checklists essentially were written in blood because something had to go wrong, very wrong, to have the standardization put in place. Or they talk about complacency. And that's something that's really stuck with me from a business standpoint is always being open-minded. Doesn't mean you have to go make a change, but just listen, listen to what's out there, talk to people, you know, and, and not being complacent with where you are, knowing that there is other people. And if you surround yourself with a network of people like we have in other industries, you realize, and like Jonathan Matoshe talks about, Think bigger. Just you've got to think bigger. And you realize that, you know, I got guys, that, they were running like a million dollar company. They joined a mastermind group. And they've been doing that company for 20 years. And all of a sudden, they join a group and they see other guys that are doing 10, 20, 30 million dollars. And we're like, holy shit, yeah, I can yeah. do that. And yeah. then now, five years later, so they, they got to send them to our company. It's crazy. So yeah. it's been, I got goosebumps talking about it because it's so cool that it works. Mm -hmm. It's really not that hard. So. 
All right, so Chad's going to be a recurring uh, guest on this podcast. I can already <laughs> tell you that. Well, hopefully that's the Dude, good. Yeah, that's awesome. the good thing, right? <laughs> I could too. Yeah. Yeah, we need to do it in person uh, later this year. I'd love it. Yeah, yep, I, I think I think Chad, I maybe mentioned it a little bit in Phoenix. I maybe not. Um, that Scoop Soldiers and the Pet Waste Millionaire brand were going on tour right now across the country. Uh, that's cool. So, Austin, I think, is November. I think we'll what does that consist of? Like, what do you mean by that? Like that? Well, first off, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, Pet Waste Millionaire, and follow because our one of our goals that is to have ten thousand followers this year. But we're doing a number of things. But in a nutshell, I'll try to keep it short. But we bought a bus, forty-five foot RV, wrapped okay. it. For Scoop Soldiers, a Pet Waste brand, Scoop Soldiers, Pet Waste Million, and Pet Waste Millionaire, um, a brand that we've launched here in the last six months. After doing a media and doing this sort of thing for the last two years and kind of tinkering around for it, we really kind of went all in. You've mentioned Jonathan Potoshnik. He's a, a mentor of mine here locally um, okay. uh, for the last decade or so. I've, I've talked to him uh, just as a competitor and as a friend and as yeah. a client of Service Autopilot. Okay. But uh, anyway, we launched, we bought this bus, we wrapped it, and we are touring, celebrating our and serving our franchisees and bringing awareness to the pet waste industry and trying to also build our pet waste millionaire brand. So we're videoing it. We're doing a docu-series. Uh, you could also say a mockumentary. There's a little bit of entertainment to it and kind of making fun of ourselves uh, in a lot of ways. That that actually literally the first episode drops tomorrow on awesome. the YouTube page. Watch it. Yeah, but we're going, we're going across the country to all of our franchisees, and we're doing events. We're going to these dog bars. If you if you have a dog yourself, you've heard of these dog bars mm -hmm. where you can bring your dog and and we're got a couple here in San Marcos. Sponsored. Exactly. So we'll be down there and and, and yeah. plan to host happy hours. So we've done Tampa, and Bryan College Station, Houston, but we've got uh, a dozen franchisees all across the country, coast to coast, from Florida all the way to Portland, Oregon. We've got service locations, our corporate operations as far as Seattle. And so we're going to all these locations and just doing events and bringing awareness to the industry, but also building this Pet Waste Millionaire brand, uh, talking about the American dream, talking about entrepreneurship, talking about home services and skilled trades. And the goal, again, is to get first to start with 10,000 followers and subscribers, but to build that to 100,000 plus. And again, the purpose in that is we need franchisees uh, mm -hmm. across the country for Scoop Soldiers. Uh, we've got, I mentioned, we've got 12 franchisees. I think we're in 17 states, but mm -hmm. we still need to go to the Northeast and we still need to go to the Midwest for Scoop Soldiers. And in the future, Chorby's going to franchise as we develop technology uh, that allows us to franchise right. beyond lawn care, beyond landscaping and tree trimming and mowing, but but also for plumbing and HVAC and garage door repair, you name it. And so mm -hmm. we need a following, A, to document our journey, but B, we need a following so that when the time comes to franchise, we can we have franchisees yep. uh, or people that are interested. So, yeah, yeah sure that'd be follow awesome. us. Uh, well, dude, absolutely. Here. Yeah, I'll get my office to follow you and too. Thanks again, Drew. Sure. For... Yes, please. As many That'd as be possible. Awesome. I, I keep joking. I'm in that phase that I remember being in a decade or more ago, where I'm like grinding for a decade ago. I was grinding for mo clients. Like, how many clients can yeah. I get? Like, it'd be 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, and I was like, all right, who can I call to make that lat that one extra close for the day? Uh, yep. I'm literally takes. doing it. Feels like I'm doing the same thing. For finding and driving subscribers to the YouTube page and to this to this docu series and such, so I'll be and, excited to see and, it work. And I should also, of course, right. I should also clarify. Also, of course, this podcast goes into all that, ties into yeah, that, brings absolutely. awareness to the podcast as well. Yeah, so, no, I think it's definitely on. relevant. Pleasure so. to get to know you and talk about your business. You definitely got yeah. some uh, innovative things you do. Well, I appreciate it, man. It's it's been a pleasure, and and, and uh, again, I know Ben made the initial. Uh, introduction and invite i appreciate it ben and ej it was awesome talking with you and, and definitely uh sounds like a bunch of smart people you know i like to surround myself with people that are smarter than me so you know hopefully if we keep keep going and staying in touch and 
you know, would love to have you on down here whenever you are down in Syria. Awesome. And if you need bookkeeping services, talk to Ben about our white picket team management. <laughs> Sorry, that's another one of our little entrepreneurial <laughs> yeah, endeavors. Good. Where, it, where, literally where today, Lang Langlitz came into the office and he's like, I have an idea. And so we, we started to draw out our 90 day book, uh, boot camp. Um, course yeah. that we're going to be launching a white nice. picket team. Nice, yeah. Stay nice. tuned so, for much more good to come in. with white picket team management and the management and leadership consulting and accounting bookkeeping that Ben and Jeremy Langlitz are building on to, really on top of what we've spent the last five years building with Scoop Salters and Chorby. So it's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Looking forward to seeing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Chad. Thanks, Thank Chad. You. We'll be uh, we'll obviously be staying in touch and um once we finish editing all this stuff we'll make sure you get uh all of the copies of everything so you can publish in your socials too um cool. we'll be tagging you guys uh and everything i know you're you guys are um staying up to date on your social media so we tried it'll be so, perfect yeah i can't take full credit for that but uh got a good team that helps so no it's yeah we try yeah there you go it's all about all right, brother. i can't do anything without them nope not at all. I appreciate it, man. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Chad. Thank you, sir. Yep. Take care. Bye. Talk to you soon.